Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by River, the place that I personally go to securely invest in Bitcoin with confidence and with zero fees. Money is property, but not all property is money. And he was using the analogies of real property in the case of real estate, but for the same reason that real estate can't facilitate the purchase of your cup of coffee or purchasing of software as a service or purchasing of a building, is the same reason that Bitcoin can and, and the distinction between money and property. It's the reason why Bitcoin is emerging as property. It can be easily transferred. It can facilitate transactions large or small for a cup of coffee or a building. Have you guys seen this NFT Nick.eth guy uh, that he's like, be rich and just like the scammers are coming back in full force and just uh, it's getting weird. You when just destroyed we... a couple of my brain cells. I don't think so, but tell us about him. <laughs> Will, have you seen this on Twitter? Oh, I have seen him. I, I was, uh, you know, scrolling through at night. I thought he was like a rapper or something. And then I turned on yeah. the volume and he's just like talking about being rich. Yeah. I'm, I'm concerned because we're not even at the having yet. <laughs> we're not even at the having. And, uh, typically, you know, in previous cycles, this is stuff that you would see in like a year and a half from now or whatever. And like, it's already cropping up and it's already getting crazy. And I think a lot of people are seeing all this building that's taking place on top of Bitcoin. And, um, they're thinking that maybe we're not going to see another scam, uh, rug pull cycle. And it, when I'm seeing this online and it's just going crazy and everybody's talking about this guy and it's, it, we're not even at the having yet. I'm just kind of concerned as to like what to expect here. So you guys are super based. Let's help the audience. Like just. Be aware, like wh what's the advice that you have for friends and family that are, that are now going to be coming to this probably for the first time and taking it serious because the fourth time it still isn't dead. And I think everybody's going to start, uh, waking up to, to what's happening here. So like, what kind of advice do you guys have? Well, you know, first of all, I'd say, you know, Nick, in this case, the NFT guy seem, seems to be like overly concerned with the haters, I believe is mm. who he's concerned with. A lot of haters out there. I, I didn't even know he existed until a couple of days ago, but apparently yeah. he already has haters. But um, so don't listen to the haters. But, um, you know, really, first of all, I mean, like, this is why most of the high integrity people I know in the space have always said, focus on Bitcoin yes. and don't focus on the rest. It's 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 uh, it's the catch all cure to protecting yourself from, you know, 90 percent of the 95 percent of the uh, grifters and scammers out there. Uh, it'll keep you focused. Now there's still some in the Bitcoin world as well. We have our own NFT scammers running about, uh, not necessarily, you know, showing off their homes and things like that. But, um, if you stick to Bitcoin, then you'll avoid 95% of it. Yeah. yeah. And then what I would add is I think that so much of this is human psychology. Um, people, Bitcoin's hard to understand and on top of it being hard to understand, people feel late. And then if they're told a story about art or digital or and it, and it's and it's easier for their mind to map to it, then they um, they can try to play catch up essentially. They want to, you know, they're being told a story about how this is going to be better than Bitcoin, and they can use these things to actually earn more Bitcoin. and that that it starts from a position of fear that you're late and that this is somehow a way to catch up. And in reality, it's going to be a way to impoverish yourself. And that it's not just stick to Bitcoin, it's actually study it and learn it because it's not rocket science. It really isn't. Um, and it's pick up a book. What, Will had a great comment when we used to be at Unchained where he's talking about holding keys and saying, you know, it's not really harder than driving a car, but if you don't know how to drive a car and get behind the wheel, you could do a lot of damage to yourself. Bitcoin is not the most complex thing in, in the world. It's also not easy to understand. It just needs some uh, dedicated attention and intentionality. And so um, it's don't feel late because if you if you pull the world, there there is no way that one in a hundred people understands Bitcoin. And if you start to to survey the people around you in your own life and you feel late, and then you accept that fact that no fewer than one in a hundred people actually get what's happening here. You're not late. 
And if you study Bitcoin, you're going to find the signal. But if you skip right past that to take what some alchemist is selling you and 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 selling you something that is too good to be true, then you're going to set yourself back and you won't just lose money. It'll probably uh, further impair your ability to want to jump in and understand Bitcoin. People will hear that and they'll see the price of $72,000 per Bitcoin and say, how can you say I'm not late? Because they're they're looking at that sum of money and it maybe exceeds their entire life savings. And they're saying, I'm very late. Like, how much higher can it go? And I think that that's a very fundamental uh, missing piece. They don't understand the problem, first of all. And then they don't understand how the how the problem is actually going to resolve itself through this this appreciation of Bitcoin. And so help people understand in, in your framing, like where is $72,000 per Bitcoin in this timeline or this adoption curve from your point of view? So I'll give, I'll give my perspective and then maybe we'll can add his. I, I really, one, the dollar is our unit of account. So while um, like I'm not going to say a number of dollars that it's going to be worth in the future, but the dollar price of, of Bitcoin is an output of people adopting it as either property or money. Um, and, and that really re-anchor on the, the idea that if you know, an adoption wave of Bitcoin happens and say 10x the number of people start demanding Bitcoin as property or money, then um, and, and you can't create any more of it if there will only ever be 21 million, then you have to bid the price up in order to um, deliver value to an existing holder of the currency to then get your fixed percentage of of the pie of, of the amount of currency. And so um, that when I talk about why seventy two thousand is still very early, it's that um, they're printing trillions upon trillions of dollars, and only one percent of the population at best understands this and. Literally, those other 99 are the ones that are still yet to adopt it as money. And so it really is the best anchor point to understand how early it is and is to index your own population or, or group of people around you. Because if you're the person that you think is, is probably most in the know, but you still don't get it, and then you look at your parents and your extended family and then you know go to work and just see what the, you know, the poll test is, that... Uh, it's very obvious that very few people get this, and then and then if you compare it in that uh, in the relative side of saying Bitcoin is just a, worth over a trillion dollars, but um, the the Federal Reserve printed five trillion between tw- 2019 and 2021. In aggregate, I believe uh, central bank global central banks increased their balance sheets by um, over 12 trillion of base money. I think the total number of, of broad money is 80 trillion. Um, the total credit system, global credit system is 400 trillion, that Bitcoin is a new form of money that's replacing all other forms of money. And very few people understand it. You can experience that in your own life. And it 72,000 is a very small number. Uh, it's it's even smaller than uh, 21 million. Uh, but 21 million of the total Bitcoin that will ever exist is incredibly infinitesimal relative to the 400 trillion credit, global credit market. Uh, and that's the thing that's collapsing. Yeah, I, I, I mean, just to piggyback on that, it's just giving someone a sense of scale. And I think that's the hard thing to do, right? Uh, Bitcoin at a trillion dollar market cap. What does that mean for other assets, other, uh, you know, monies for the economy in general? Um, you know, it's only very recently that anyone dared utter the, the T word trillion, right? Um, that wasn't part of the way we talked about money in 2008 when Bitcoin, 2009, when Bitcoin was first coming out, you know, uh, the original tarps were what, uh, at 600, 800 billion, something like that. They were still under, no one would say the T word. So giving them a sense of scale that 1 trillion is actually, you know, on the global scheme of things fairly early. I mean, we're still talking about gold at what, 12, 13 now. Um, yeah, is, uh, it's, it's a, it's a very small part of the financial world in this moment so small that there are many use cases that it can't serve right now and if you think that bitcoin is ultimately going to serve some of those use cases like other companies other than microstrategy holding you know uh, uh 
exposing themselves to Bitcoin on the balance sheet. At this price point, it's, it's not even useful to a company like Apple with hundreds of billions of dollars. Yeah, which is mind blowing to to think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Also, that was a good point. I mean, I liked I was somebody who had to understand why gold was money in order to then understand why Bitcoin was money and 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 the the properties that were inherent in it that that are now inherent in Bitcoin that are that are causing global adoption of Bitcoin. But people don't have to understand gold in order to understand Bitcoin. So as I, I did personally. But if you think about like this question of how early it is, it's someone doesn't have to understand why gold has emerged as money, but they generally know that it did. They're familiar with the gold standard. And the reality is that gold emerges money over thousands of years. And this is year 15 of Bitcoin. So the amount of time, where it is today versus where it was at inception, and then uh, the relative few number of people that actually get what's happening. And you can test that in your own environment. And then the it costs nothing to print a trillion dollars, you know, uh, it costs nothing to print five trillion. And that's really, that's really the problem that we're, we're here solving. Uh, recently we had, uh, Bill Ackman for people that aren't familiar, very famous value investor. Um, he tweeted, uh, and is now talking about Bitcoin all of a sudden, uh, I'm going to read this tweet. It's a little long, but I'm going to read, uh, what he said. And I'm looking for your feedback and your thoughts on, on the comment. He says, Bitcoin price uh, rise leads to increased mining and greater energy use, driving up the cost of energy, causing inflation to rise and the dollar to decline, driving demand for Bitcoin and increased mining, driving demand for energy in the cycle continues. Bitcoin goes to infinity, energy prices skyrocket, and the economy collapses. Maybe I should buy some Bitcoin. Some serious tongue-in-cheek. Uh, what, uh, what are your thoughts on this comment? You want to go first? Yeah. I mean, you know, Bill seems to be waking up to quite a few things recently, um, not just Bitcoin, but um, <laughs> uh, he's learning a lot about the world. This is like a coming of age moment for Bill Ackman. Uh, I know he's a lot smarter than me in a lot of ways, but uh, it, it's very encouraging and everyone goes through their own path. But um, no, what I would encourage him to do, and I know several people reached out to him on Twitter, but if, in case he listens to this, is um, to actually listen to the heads of the uh, grid systems, uh, in the United States, uh, those like TVA and ERCOT, where the presidents of, uh, those like critical infrastructure have talked about the fact that Bitcoin is helping them not just stabilize the grid, but lower energy costs. Now his ultimate conclusion there is correct that he should be buying Bitcoin, but not necessarily for the reasons that he stated, namely that, um, you know, Bitcoin's interplay into the energy markets is actually one that to date and probably for the foreseeable future will be drastically lowering the price of, um, of electricity, uh, which again, uh, the biggest operators of the largest grids in the United States are already recognizing and sort of competing over, uh, getting that business. Yeah. I'd say like Bill is just lost in a very scary fiat world. And he's just, he's kind of, he's, <laughs> he's very fiat minded. You know, it's hard to get out of that, that fiat mindset when, when that is your life. Uh, but that point that that Will made, I'll make it slightly different. That end about like Bitcoin driving the price of electricity down, and everybody has this this idea of the dollar price of electricity. Well, if you're a Bitcoin holder and the price of Bitcoin is going up, what is getting less expensive? Not only everything, but particularly electricity. That the value of the currency is buying more and more electricity. So without even having to make an argument about um, about what you know, Bitcoin mining will do for energy. It's just this this fact that if you are a holder of Bitcoin, the currency, the price of your electricity in a Bitcoin denominated world continues to go down, down, down. The other thing that he j just missed about economy or the ways that quote economy works and doesn't collapse is that he's right that a rise in the price of Bitcoin will uh, will result in an increased demand to mine bitcoin which will increase the demand for power the the massive thing that this wall street genius just missed was in result of a rise in prices does come supply so if there's this resource power and there and there and on a relative basis there's there's a bid for it then what do people do they build more power 
that's that's the way that money works. So it's hey, you use money, you turn it into you know you trade it for resources, you then sell whatever you created for more money, and that what we're actively seeing happen, you know, here in the state of Texas where there's a lot of mining, there's more de demand for power, and just in the last uh, two weeks, there's been an announcement of a 1.5 gigawatt facility uh, and a 900 megawatt facility. So, you know, in in Ackman's like circular, you know, thought process of like higher price of Bitcoin, more mining, he didn't think about, well, what about supply? You know, what about supply for power? And he also, I don't think, or at least he didn't intimate it, the understanding of the power problem, the duck curve and Bitcoin and to Will's point about, you know, the the CEO of ERCOT, the president of TVA, understanding just how valuable a large flexible load is. And so um, it is that that Bitcoin is perfectly complementary to grids. It actually solves a problem for grids. That That's why on a fundamental level, it will drive down the cost of power. Second thing is, as the price of Bitcoin goes up, your power costs go down if you're a Bitcoin holder. That's a good thing for you. And then the third thing is that the actual increase in demand for power drives increase of supply. Uh, money is the one thing that uh, cannot have, a, or if you have good money, like Bitcoin, does not have a supply response uh, because it is finitely scarce or in other forms of money in, in terms of gold, it was relatively scarce, but it was also relatively harder to go get more gold out of the ground relative to producing other things that were more readily available or could be produced from more readily available resources. So supply is the key in this equation, Bill. Um, we can turn on uh, tens and tens of gigawatts of power and it's going to be great for everybody. I'd throw in one more piece of advice for Bill here, which is like, I don't know if there's a word for it, like an anti- appeal to authority, which is, you know, all those professors and administrators that you just found out know nothing about the world and in fact are infecting people's brains at Harvard, uh, specifically your kids, they all think Bitcoin mining's terrible, running up energy prices, and so that's a counter signal to you. Yeah, we'll have to get him a, um, I, we, we screened a copy of Elena um, Medievia's uh, Stranded documentary, which is a, a short of her dirty coin. So we'll have to we'll have to see yeah. if we can't get old Bill Ackman a, a pre-screening of that. I'll call in a favor for him. I saw a Sailor responded to him, so hopefully he takes him up on uh, yeah. offering some some help. One of the other things that I think isn't even being discussed in in both of your salient points is uh, we're incentivizing energy uh, infrastructure at the the cheapest that we can build it. Right. It's it's being built in areas that incentivize four cents or si between four or five cents per kilowatt hour in today's prices. So, like, that's the part that uh, I just find miraculous that, that people can't piece it together, that you're creating this incentive structure of the most ESG friendly thing that that's ever been done without public policy pl playing a role in trying to build more energy. Um, it's not me saying this anymore. This and, and, and other Bitcoin are saying this anymore. You literally have BlackRock putting on th these large summits in the past month, and they had an entire section uh, for Wall Street uh, banks that they're that they're providing this for. That they're saying Bitcoin is ESG friendly, and they're having speakers of of uh, people within the Bitcoin space that I know up there literally talking these points. Troy Cross being one of them. Um, if you would have told me this three months ago, I would not have believed you for a second that you would have an entity like BlackRock basically propagating these true messages that have been so lost on everybody for so long. So like, what, how, what do you guys take away from something like that? Is this, I mean, this is good, right? I, I don't really know what to say, but I'm, I'm just blown away by it. Yeah. I, th I think my, my view is completely agree one if, if somebody gets one layer down of bitcoin mining they will begin to understand that that bitcoin miners have every incentive to go find the cheapest sources of power and and then the next layer down you'll figure out that the cheapest source of power is closest to the fuel um functionally now there are other reasons strategically why it might not be closest to the fuel in terms of acting as a balancing effect to to large city centers and so, so that that point is right. It's just that 
Um, for me, the key of this, and and I do think it, it it's not curious that BlackRock, once they got into the, the Bitcoin ETF game, that they would change their tune on uh, what is and isn't ESG. Um, I think that there was like, um, like weapons of mass destruction can be ESG depending on you well, know sure. who owns the company. And so I think what happened first was they figured out that there was an incentive to make money issuing a Bitcoin ETF. If they didn't do it, someone else was going to do it. And the next part of that was, well, we can't keep parroting these ESG things because this, um, you know, we've been saying that Bitcoin's bad for the environment for so long, but but our but our us as BlackRock, we want to make money. So now we're going to drop the term ESG, which Larry Fink said that they would do in June of last year. And now it's not curious that they've they've shifted around to now explain that it's actually good because it aligns with their profit um, incentive. And so I think all of that perfectly maps. It's just in order to understand why Bitcoin goes out and seeks the, the lowest cost power, you got to understand something fundamentally about Bitcoin and energy. I I wasn't using that as an explanation because it was just this more broad economic fact that as you bid the price up of something, people supply more of it. Uh, particularly in the context of power, then that actually drives down the resource. The more that you can deliver of it, drive you know drives economies of scale, drives costs down, um, and that's you know that is what is going to happen in Bitcoin mining in Texas. To give you an understanding, there's about I think the peak demand last year, which was the peak ever, was about 85 gigawatts. The average demand is 40 gigawatts, and that difference between 80 and and 40 or 85 and 40 causes real real havoc for um, reliability, um, particularly in certain parts of the year where those type of things can swing from from day to night. And so Bitcoin mining is going to incentivize 40 more gigawatts of power to be online. That creates economic incentives for the power companies to lower the cost broadly. But then in, in addition to that, we're probably going to build another 80 gigawatts in Texas to support not just Bitcoin mining, but other economic uh, or sources of demand that generate real economic activity. And so um, I think it's great that that BlackRock is now um, recognizing all of the great benefits for um, the world and sustainability that, that come with Bitcoin. I happen to believe that their number one motive is profit. Yeah. And Preston, you know, it's good. It's going to be hard. I mean, I do agree with the premise of your you know comment. However, it's going to be hard to get me too excited over, you know, the idea that uh, Bitcoin being ESG friendly is a good thing for the world or, or that notion is a good thing for the world, given that the premise of ESG is completely ridiculous yeah. on its face. However, I do get your point that like, you know, the gatekeepers that there are on wall street and in the, the world financial market saying Bitcoin is good for the environment is probably good for us. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I love your point, Will, because it's like you're you're almost playing into their hand by by even saying ESG and talking sure. about it as as being a valid uh, objective talking point. But uh, yeah, I just find it quite miraculous that they're like totally leaning into what are very valid and true. Like if you sit down with somebody who deeply understands this and you go very deep on the facts around it, um, it's just it's a little refreshing to see some of the uh, the legacy talking heads really start to embrace these ideas that we know are true and valid. Sure. So, yeah. I mean, Preston, I don't know what you think, but I thought what was more remarkable about Larry Fink's comments was not the ESG side, but the fact that he came out and said, if you're worried about your government, if you're scared of your government, <laughs> if you're scared of money printing in your, the, the jurisdiction that you live in, like, that that's not someone who's gone halfway down the rabbit hole. No, like you're that right. that's a pretty advanced understanding of the value proposition of Bitcoin. I just when he started this is I think in the summer time frame when he started saying the word hope and in, yes. in the same sentences I was like okay Michael Saylor has a website that's literally hope.com and like all this stuff's laid out there it seems like he was you know binge watching the breed love sailor <laughs> series and like whatever else right uh anyway uh Speaking of Michael, so he was on CNBC today, purchased another 12,000 BTC for 821.7 million US dollars. They now have 205,000 Bitcoin. Wow, that's more than me. Uh, more than I'm ever nah, going to have. No way. <laughs> 205,000 Bitcoin at a basis of 33 
uh, $1,706, um, which we're more than double that now. This is, this is crazy. This is crazy. But the part that I found really interesting, and I think that what you two are building really kind of plays into, uh, is a little contra to, to maybe what Michael was saying in this interview. It was like, I don't know how long, maybe seven. No, it was like 12 minutes long. This, this clip, um, he was really delineating the difference between Bitcoin as a property and Bitcoin as a currency. Uh, he's been kind of beating this drum for for years now, and um, it, it, one of the key talking points that he said in the in the video in the clip, he says, "Medium of exchange is only worth a trillion dollars, whereas property makes Bitcoin worth a hundred trillion dollars." And it's almost like uh, anytime Bitcoin is brought up as a currency, he is really pushing back and saying, "No, no, 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 this is a savings technology that you got to treat it like property on on Fifth Avenue." Hold on, I got another quote here. This is a quote that he said during the interview. He said, no one is trying to buy coffee with the equity that they hold from a building on Fifth Avenue yeah. um, to, to reinforce this idea that he thinks Bitcoin should be viewed as property. What are your thoughts on this? Is, is this constructive? Uh, is this, uh, I think this is the real question I have. Is this a G7, I'm in a very developed economy talking point versus maybe how the rest of the world sees Bitcoin? Um, what are your thoughts on some of this stuff between property and currency? So, um, well, one, I guess first, we're building a company for Bitcoin payments. Um, yeah. Previously yeah. worked on Bitcoin custody and kind of understand the long-term store of value um, premise and, and rationale for Bitcoin, but also where we're coming from is we're building a Bitcoin co payments company because we believe that uh, it's important to do and take take that with with an inherent bias that exists also that uh i personally I won't speak for will but no he shares it you know a, a great degree of respect uh, and appreciation for both michael Saylor personally as well as uh micro strategy as a company and that what they're doing uh both for bitcoin but then also uh strategically um you know in terms of the corporate strategy and the results that it's having for their shareholders is quite smart oh yeah and uh i'm a shareholder let me tell you i'm yeah very very happy i'm a very I, happy I, camper <laughs> i don't ahead, own sorry. any public equities or any securities that aren't you know uh equity in, in businesses that i've helped run but if i did the only one would probably be micro strategy so yeah um, and that i think that uh, my personal perspective is that you know if it comes to owning bitcoin through a security that micro strategy would be better than owning it in etf because he's actually trying to generate more Bitcoin per share. Um, that being said, we're going to have an inherent disagreement about, you know, his opinion of, of Bitcoin as, uh, as property or money. And that, um, you know, he made the comment about, you know, there's no one who's trying to, to buy a cup of coffee with, with equity, you know, a fraction of the equity of their fifth Avenue building. And I think the point is that, um, it's because building isn't isn't money. Um, and the thing that he didn't distinguish is that money is property, but not all property is money. And and he was using the analogies of of real property in the case of real estate, but but for the same reason that real estate can't facilitate the purchase of your cup of coffee or you know, the purchasing of software as a service or purchasing of a building, uh, is the same reason that Bitcoin can and, and the distinction between money and property. And so um, the same reason that real estate can't serve as money is, is the reason why Bitcoin is emerging as property. It can be easily transferred. It can facilitate uh, transactions large or small for a cup of coffee or a building. And I also think that um, there really isn't a st distinction between a store of value and a medium of exchange. Money does both. Uh, and even Michael Saylor is, you know, is intermediating a series of, of exchanges and storing his value in Bitcoin. He, you know, just today converted dollars into Bitcoin um, and he's going to hold those Bitcoin hopefully a hundred years, but then he's going to exchange it at some future point in time. And so really what he's talking about is the, is the difference of time horizon and the type of transactions. But the mere fact that Bitcoin can do that is is why it's such a good form of money. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a mind reader, but, um, I can try to put myself in, uh, Michael Saylor's shoes on this and like, like, uh, Parker, 
have a lot of respect for him. But, you know, if I'm operating a public company and I've just pulled off, you know, one of the greatest speculative attacks of all time, ever, you know, ever. stacking, stacking sats the way he has been, I'd want to portray myself as the least threatening way possible to my yeah. regulators and to the jurisdiction that I operate my business in. And so again, I have no reason to believe he's not saying exactly what he thinks, but if I were in that position, I would portray that is what I think about Bitcoin because it makes me less threatening. Um, it, uh, does not challenge the ultimate status quo, which is, you know, the U S dollar. And there's no reason to rock that boat. If I'm Michael Saylor, I'm perfectly happy portraying Bitcoin as a skyscraper on fifth Avenue and, uh, that's okay, but we don't have to view it that way. And, um, I don't think most people that have Bitcoin or, you know, have knowledge about Bitcoin think of Bitcoin outside of its, you know, monetary use use cases. Yeah, I totally agree with your point there, and and um, I've always kind of felt like that might be the reason why uh, he kind of goes about it and in, in talking it talking about it in those terms. But I think for people that deeply understand uh, Bitcoin. Uh, especially when you look at it from, uh, you know, outside of a G7 country, like if I'm out of the United States and I take myself to some other developing nation state and I'm dealing with a local currency that's getting debased by 70 or hundred percent a year, and I can't get access to a bank account and, uh, all of those, all of those types of things, I'm looking at Bitcoin I can see layer two, I can immediately settle and I can conduct payments. And I'm saying, how in the world is this not the, the, the the currency bitcoin as a currency it can be property and currency to to True. to uh, parker's very thoughtful point um how in the world am i not saying in and if somebody comes to my store let's say i'm a, a store and i'm a vendor like i'm looking at them like you can pay in bitcoin and and take that that coke or that coffee or whatever it is or else you can just leave and and i'm not going to give you this proof of work thing that that is sitting in my store because I'm not accepting the worthless currency that's debasing at 100% a year. Like, yeah. I'm sorry. It's just, I think that's where the world is moving very quickly, especially in developing nations. And hey, maybe 10 years from now, 15, 20 years from now, it's, it's a way bigger payment role in developing nation states. But how, I, I guess I can't understand how somebody couldn't see it that way. Right yeah. I, I, I honestly thought at the beginning of that interview that he was going to sort of change his tune because he's, he's been saying mostly this for at least a year, if not a year and a half now uh, around this like Bitcoin is property uh, type thing. But when he was comparing Bitcoin to gold and talking about Bitcoin overtaking, you know, eating up gold's uh, uh, market cap, he was mentioning, you know, you know, what if you had gold that you could send to Japan in a, a matter of minutes, you know, oh, teleport, teleport to Japan in a matter of minutes from the United States, which, you know, again was, I was like, oh, wow, he's going to go on that angle, which is basically talking about, you know, its monetary, uh, qualities as a medium of exchange, uh, at least part, partly so. And so, uh, I think that there's a little bit of, uh, you know, the, the, the use cases that will help Bitcoin overtake gold are also why it's better money to any other commodity, uh, or a property. But, um, yeah, I just thought that was interesting. Yeah. And I think I, I really personally don't distinguish between, and, and I understand the places are different. You know, he, like he uses the example, even to your question, there's a lot of the world that doesn't even have access to the dollar as, as you know, from a store of value perspective as, as bad as the dollar is, but it's functioning and it buys you a lot of things. So, mm -hmm. um, it, it is, it is a uh, far more functional than the then a form of money that doesn't even do that um and that um and that could be in africa or it could be re literally anywhere that's either experiencing hyperinflation today in some country or just doesn't have access to a form of money that the rest of the world will readily accept but you know he made the comment i believe something like you know if you're in africa what would you buy like you know real estate or bitcoin but if you flip it around it's really the same thing if you're selling goods or services. So like, what are you saying? You should, you know, if you're in the U S you should sell goods and services for dollars and then turn around and sell those dollars to then get Bitcoin to do what he's doing. Or why not take out the very costly step? Um, you know, Bitcoin's gone up by 20% over the last 
weak. It's like if you're you're just taking out an unnecessary step if you actually want the Bitcoin, right? If I I could take dollars, which I do in my business, but I also take Bitcoin, but the dollars that I do get, I then convert to Bitcoin. The same thing that he's doing for his business. So the point is, why not just do that on a direct basis? My my number one point is, at some point, your form of money is not going to uh, it's, it's going to stop working. And I get that that's controversial to say, but the fact that it's controversial doesn't change the fact that it's also the reality of printing a, a lot of money and that you really... Is is one trillion every 90 days of, of printing a lot of money? That's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of money, Will. Uh, it's actually it's actually too much. It's, it's so much that the human brain cannot even conceive. No what it represents yeah. in terms of some some tangible value. And and so when you start to realize that it's like we actually have the same problem that everybody else in the world has, regardless of if we're in a G7 country and we have the global reserve currency, the problem is that our values being debased and that our currency is being destroyed. And we need to solve both of those things. We have to um, find a better form of money that stores value but it's part and parcel. If you if it's not easy to exchange, then it's not going to store value. It's going to store value because it's going to be easily exchangeable with 8 billion people who all have first probably bought Bitcoin on their balance sheets and then uh, figure it out at a, at a later point in time that if they want to acquire the Bitcoin most efficiently, they can because unlike a, a building, it's actually possible to, to transfer it. In this case, in Bitcoin, it's possible to do over a communication channel. Uh, but then also... Like there's a reason why you can't go into your grocery store and buy um bic or buy groceries with a treasury bond or a security or a security like MicroStrategy. You can do that with Bitcoin because of its properties, not just that it has a fixed supply, but you can transfer it without counterparty risk. Mm -hmm. You can transfer it with counterparty risk too, but a uh, stock or a bond is not capable of being transferred without a counterparty risk because trust is core to the nature of a security and the trustless nature of Bitcoin is core to its ability to function as both a store of value and uh, an ability to exchange it in return for uh, real goods and services or dollars. One of the most common questions I get asked from family and friends is, Preston, where do you personally buy your Bitcoin from? And the answer is really simple. I buy it on river.com. Not only can you easily buy Bitcoin with zero fees on recurring orders, you can have peace of mind knowing Bitcoin on River is held one-to-one -one in multi-sig cold storage, all while being fully licensed and regulated in the United States. Plus, their relationship managers are US-based and available by phone for you or your business. Additionally, River has built their own infrastructure from the ground up, which means they don't rely on third parties to function like other Bitcoin exchanges. River also just created a new feature not found anywhere else called River Link. It allows you to send Bitcoin over a text message to easily orange pill your family, pay a friend for dinner, or send a gift. There's a new standard for investing in Bitcoin and River is setting it. Go to river.com slash fundamentals and get up to $100 free when you sign up and buy Bitcoin. That's river.com slash fundamentals. Yeah, let's not miss two very obvious points as well. One is Bitcoin is literally money. I mean, it's legal tender in at least one country. That's a good point. Right. Um, and uh, it's used to the tune of tens and hundreds of millions of dollars every single day as a medium of exchange right now, you know, today, even in its infancy. Um, number two, though, is like not everyone has the same sort of, you know, not everyone has the balance sheet or the savings that Michael Saylor has to buy Bitcoin the way the way that he's doing right now. And if they want to obtain Bitcoin, one, one of the best ways to do it is just to sell a good or service or your time, uh, re receive it as payment, just, you know, instead of receiving dollars, taking the counterparty risk, the fees involved with, with, uh, exchanging, uh, you know, being a Forex trader, you just take Bitcoin on a principled basis for your time or for your goods. Yeah, because you can. I, I had mentioned earlier that in some of these developing nations that have like really bad currencies with a lot of inflation that the, the store owner would just say, hey, you're either paying with Bitcoin or you're going to get out. But uh, Ben Perrin, uh, when I was over in Madeira, him and I were having a conversation and he had just recently, he has this amazing video that uh, Parker and Will uh, had built with Zaprite that 
Um, you can see how, how to use it, uh, how the API works uh, for people that are trying to integrate it. But one of the things that he said to me when, when we were over there was, uh, he's like, Preston, there's this really important like mental breakthrough for me when I was setting this up that uh, if I'm selling a good or service and the price is, is X, uh, I have another price that's in fiat that is 20% higher than X uh, for anybody that wants to pay in fiat instead of Bitcoin. And he's like, it sounds so simple and just so uh, like, like it's almost like it's not anything, but he, he's like, I think it's a really big jump because instead of it being a discount, uh, if you pay in Bitcoin, he's like, I think people just mentally are looking at it and say, well, of course I want to pay, pay the lower price. I don't want to pay 20% more. And he's like, it's a really big deal. And I, it, it struck me and I was just, I just kept thinking about it. And this is kudos to you guys for implementing this. And, but going back to the, the store owner. I don't mm -hmm. think it's going to be this, this leap from you go into that store one day and they're accepting both their, their legacy currency and Bitcoin. I think it's going to be almost like a checkout or like a mobile phone. And it's like, here it is. You can pay in Bitcoin for this price. And if you're paying me with this really terrible currency, I'm just slapping a 40% uh, additional fee on top of it. Cause I don't want that. Like sure. I'll take it, but I don't want it. And, and this is the. I think that's how it's going to slowly progress and, and take hold all around the world is you're going to see this, this model that you guys so thoughtfully constructed um, play out. So I, I don't know if there's a question in there or that you no, guys have anything else that you want to add, but. No, it resonates a lot. I mean, like it was very intentional uh, to frame it as a premium. I think that was Parker's brainchild, actually. Although who knows at this point, we just sit together all day, you know, talking. So. Uh, I can't up with these stupid ideas. Yeah, I, I think it was Parker's brainchild, but really it's about, you know, signaling preference, right? And um, that, you know, if you own a store or if you're selling something online or if you're a dentist that owns their own dental practice or lawyer or something like that, you have unilateral control over how you, you know, bill your customers uh, and charge for your products. And when you show a preference like that, like you're you're likely to get what you want, right? And if you want Bitcoin, there's probably not a better way to signal that preference than, you know, Parker always distinguishes between, you know, Bitcoin accepted here and Bitcoin preferred here. Right. And now you're saying Bitcoin, I, I prefer you pay me in Bitcoin. In fact, I will, you know, give you a, you know, a discount if you pay or, or you're, you'll have to pay a premium if you, uh, pay in uh, fiat, uh, one, one company I like a lot that's been doing this for a long time is, uh, Mulvad, uh, VPN is that they've had Bitcoin as an option for years and they've always, always, always given a discount if you paid in Bitcoin. Now it's framed differently, but you know, the, the signaling of preference is the same. And I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure they've stacked quite a few sets through that. Yeah. And then I, I do think the framing is important. Um, I use, I use it with my book and I can just tell you that when I put a 10% premium on my book, if people want to pay in fiat, my my view of it, and I'll talk about it in the broader context of of the importance of Bitcoin payments, is that um, there's a cost. It's like Bitcoin is a better form of money. It's a better form of money because it allows you to store value better, but also there's not a single point of failure in terms of how you are receiving, um, or there doesn't have to be. And that if you're getting paid directly from your customers, you have a, not only a more liquid form of currency, but you also have a more div diversity of your liquidity, which is important. Um, and that when I put a 10% premium on, price communicates information. So the price of any good is a communication of information. If you say, hey, it costs 10% more, the book costs $30, but if you want to pay me in dollars, it costs 33. I don't actually have to have a conversation with the person. I can communicate information about the cost of the thing. And it doesn't make sense to me to say, if you want to give me the better form of money, you can actually pay less. It's that if you want to give me the worst form of money, you're going to have to pay me more because there's a cost associated with it. And then in, in both the, the way that it's a debt-based currency that has a ton of counterparty risk that introduces all this cost that someone's got to pay for it and if you want it to be me, I'm actually going to say, nope, it needs to be you. Um, and then in addition to that, it's the volatility. So if you know, a lot of merchant processing takes 
10, 15, 20 days to, to, you know, send to you, there's the risk of chargebacks. So if Bitcoin's appreciating, you know, on average over the last 10 years by 1% a day or whatever it is, then, you know, if I'm, if I'm having to wait on into perpetuity, 20 days to convert my dollars to Bitcoin that I'm earning through my business, uh, that's another cost in addition to just the processing fees. But on a broader standpoint, the way that we think about it is Bitcoin is a new form of money. People are adopting it for the first time. It's not like buying a different car or buying a different building or buying um, something else that's marginally different than something else you've bought several times in your life. People have to, you know, first the tools to secure Bitcoin had to be built in order to allow people to adequately know that they could hold it without losing it. That's that's what improved the store of value property, improved methods of custody of Bitcoin. That's what we worked at it on chain. Um, but the point is that in order for people to accept Bitcoin as payment, you have to build the tools, right? They've never existed before. You, you can plug the euro into the dollar system and the yen into the dollar system because they're functionally the same. It's a trust-based system. Bitcoin is a new form of money. And in order for businesses to be able to receive Bitcoin as payment, like there's there's di many different types of transactions that require different products. And so we're not just building a quote, Bitcoin payments coming, we're building something specific for a certain type of customer based on certain types of payments. And the product has to be the right product and it has to be dead simple. And, and, and the product being the right product is being able to build features like what Ben mentioned to you of things that people actually value that actually incentivize the payer to pay in Bitcoin. But in addition to that, a, a big part of our philosophy of making it dead simple and reducing the burden on the business is that it does need to be, you can receive Bitcoin side by side with fiat because both exist today and businesses need actually to survive on both for some foreseeable future. So uh, that's another thing that's core to Zapri is we make it really easy to receive Bitcoin and Lightning, on-chain and Lightning, side by side with fiat, such that the business, when they're thinking about that decision point, it's marginal. It's, it's do I want to give Bitcoin as an option? Because if you're going to make me go through an entirely different process, I'm not going to do it. I'll just yeah. take the Bitcoin and convert it to, or, or the fiat and convert it to Bitcoin. And so we think about all those things. How do we lower the bar such that the, the number of businesses that actually accept it as payment is 10x, 100x, 1000x. And uh, I'm pretty sure selling software internationally is going to be a great application to get more Bitcoin pound for pound than if you took an Argentine peso and then converted it to a dollar and then converted it to Bitcoin. It, I, I mean, I would add in there that, you know, it's not just the merchant preference that we're focused on, although we do focus on that side of the equation for the most part, but we're, we're also making a deal with the merchant. Like we're going to deliver your customers an easier way to pay, not just with Bitcoin, just an easier way to pay in general. Right. And that if it's not easier to buy something online with Bitcoin than it is with dollars, I anticipate those customers are going to gravitate towards paying with dollars because it's simpler. Right. So not only are we trying to like highlight the fact that the merchant can pay with a better form of money and, and recognize their preference for that, we have to treat their customers to a better experience. And honestly, we have all the tools we need. I, I, I would say we're about even right now, um, if not slightly better uh, than, um, than taking fiat payments, but we're going to be way better. It's going to be so much simpler, to, uh, regardless of whether you're using custodial, non-custodial methods of payment. It's going to be way simpler, already is about as simple to pay with Bitcoin um, rather than fiat. So I'll, I'll just say I've used uh, the, the ZapRite service whenever I ordered Parker's book. It was phenomenal. It couldn't have been any easier. It was super clean. Um, but when I'm looking at, uh, I guess this has been my talking point for the last year and a half, two years, is you don't have this natural demand signal that's really kind of incentivizing payments quite yet. And what I was saying that I think is going to really help boost that incentive, that natural incentive, is once Bitcoin makes a new all-time high. Because the, the when you look all around the world, everybody's saying, oh, the dollar has done so much better. When Bitcoin was at, at 16000 a coin after going to call it 69000 
Um, they're looking at that and they're saying, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm kind of forgetting about Bitcoin at that point because in dollar terms, it's way off of where it was. True. Now we're at a very, very interesting point in time because we just made a new all time high. I think everybody around the world is starting to look at this thing in their own local currency or even the dollar terms. And they're saying, this is the fourth time that it's, it's supposedly died three or four times at this point, And now it's back. It's rebirthed itself again. And I think you're going to start getting vendors that are saying, uh, you got a turnkey API that's going to allow me to accept payments. Yeah. I might only have one out of a hundred people that come through the door willing to, to pay at a discount to the, the fiat price. But if it's really simple and really easy to do, and they are wanting to receive this superior form of money, I think things really start to change in the coming two years from a demand, a natural demand signal for, for Bitcoin payments. I'm assuming you guys agree with that, but, uh, oh, yeah. what, what kind of thoughts do you guys have around, uh, the demand, the natural market demand for, for payments picking up? Yeah. I mean, I agree with your statement. I would say that's also a really rational way to think about it. Right. Is like, you know, every four years we keep on hitting new all time highs that just builds up credibility over time. Right. You know, Bitcoin. Every day it doesn't die, builds up a little bit more credibility over time. So I agree that like these types of signals, there's there's moments in Bitcoin's history that that lend it credibility. You know, the you know, when the Silk Road coins are seized and then they're auctioned off and not destroyed, right? That's a moment of credibility, right? When the first public company adds it to its balance sheet, that's a moment of credibility. When it survives uh, internal strife and struggle in 2017, that's a moment of credibility. And every time you see it surpassing all-time highs in conversion to U.S. dollars, that's a moment of credibility. So, yeah, I think this one is going to get, going to get a lot of attention. I think it's one of those things that makes people think, you know, I have to get more of this or I'm not exposing my business to something weird or scary or something like that. And yeah, in terms of like the driver, um, all time high helps, but it's really just about people, you know, same way individuals make the decision. I want to hold Bitcoin businesses are going to make those same decisions as well. And they're just run by the same people that are getting it individually. I do see that, um, you know, and our client base would, would, uh, bear this out that, uh, it's easier for companies that are independently owned, you know, sole proprietors, uh, to, to make that unilateral decision to accept Bitcoin. We're going to see a lot of lawyers, a lot of dentists, you know, things like that, that, that own their own businesses, but more and more, it's going to become untenable for people sitting on the boards of bigger businesses to say, you know, well, I do this for myself, but I don't do this for, you know, my business, right? Whether that's, you know, holding Bitcoin on, on the balance sheet and, uh, for treasury purposes or, you know, having this superior, um, uh, payment structure, you know, set up for your customers. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, the all time high helps there. Uh, so do all these other credibility lending, you know, the ETF, uh, moments, and then it's just a series of those independent decisions that are being made that ultimately leads us to a big marketplace of people accepting Bitcoin. It's also, yeah, it's just, all, it's also very organic. So one of the things I think Preston, you and I might have talked about this a few days uh, when we were together um, at the summit, but if Bitcoin, whatever it is today, it's over a trillion dollars. I don't know what, if it's like 1.2 trillion or 1.3. Yeah, two um, or three. That that's a lot of purchasing power. And so if we're just thinking one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin terms, we're building a Bitcoin payments company and we're specifically building it because we recognize that, you know, orders of magnitude more people are going to demand Bitcoin to hold it as a property or money, however you want to define it. And that that is going to result in orders of magnitude more people demanding Bitcoin payments. Uh, we're delivering a service that the people that are holding the 21 million supply are currently, it's like 19.6 million, say, okay, we need to, we need to find a way that the, the, that the, something that the holders of the value or the holders of the currency value so that they can then pay us. Um, and that as that number gets larger in, in, in real purchasing power, it becomes more relevant to more business owners saying like, hey, if you start to look and see that Bitcoin is the on what some metric or the other, the sixth largest currency in the world or the 11th largest currency in the world, you want to sell to those people. You want to sell your goods and services. 
it's also so that's the macro that as bitcoin becomes more of value by more people it is a more significant opportunity for people selling goods and services uh, and it's harder for them to ignore um if you think about apple as an example like will makes the, uh, a good point that i agree with is like apple the company market cap is still bigger than bitcoin it's hard to store value in something that you're bigger than um, now that will flip too apple will be probably the last company that gets flipped by bitcoin but if you think about it relative to currencies they're selling phones to people in more than just seven currencies in the world mm -hmm. um that bitcoin as a purchasing power aggregate entity is larger than practically any other economy the that they can largest. possibly sell to that that is a hard economic fact that is difficult to ignore as, and particularly as bitcoin gets larger but at the same time it really is an individual decision so while that's that's the macro that, that's driving uh the driving force um the individual is the one who is in most control of particularly an individual who's a business owner to say what do they want uh in terms of a currency to be paid in and and that's really where we focus there is also the rationale from the, the payer side uh i think it's more derivative the example is i want my rancher to be around and selling me beef and he wants to be paid in bitcoin so i pay him in bitcoin i value my doctor if she wants to be paid in bitcoin uh and i know that she's more likely to be around if she's um if she has bitcoin so if she wants to be paid in bitcoin i'll pay her in bitcoin the driving force is the merchant saying i understand why bitcoin stores value and therefore it's rational for me to accept bitcoin as payment because it's the most efficient way to get and so we really view it as um you know it it is something that is dynamic between you know buyer and seller the seller is the one in control and more, as more sellers understand why bitcoin is of value to the world it just becomes the rational thing for them to do to drive the shift to say i'm going to give you the option to pay me in bitcoin I'm not going to cut off my nose to spite my face and say I'm not going to accept fiat, even though for businesses that do that, more power to them. You know, a few businesses will be able to dictate those type of terms. Uh, but starting with an option yep. is the most rational thing to do for a business owner that understand why it stores value. And if you just multiply the number of people that understand Bitcoin by 10 or 100, then there's more people who are also going to figure out why it's most efficient to, to just open it up as an option to be paid that way. A, a little inside baseball for your listeners, Preston here, if they've ever worked in software development or, you know, built a company, you know, a software company, a, a lot of times entrepreneurs, they'll avoid two-sided markets. They're very mm -hmm. difficult to build, right? Mm -hmm. um, I built one before at Stack Overflow. We had a recruiting site where you have employers and then you have employees or, or prospective employees, applicants, right? And you build that and you're like, what do we focus on? Do we focus on, you know, the employer side of it? Or do we focus on, you know, the, the, the developers over here in the stack overflow world that are trying to get jobs. And I always go back to the, the original two sided marketplace on the internet, which is online dating. Mm -hmm. And, uh, for the, uh, heterosexual, uh, marketplace out there, you know, it's very obvious you have a two sided market and only one side matters. If you have hot girls, then you have a dating app. And if you don't mm. have hot girls, then you don't have a dating app. Mm. And, and so whenever you're building a two-sided marketplace, it's a good idea to ask yourself, who are the hot girls in this two-sided marketplace, right? It's an easy sort of heuristic to go through. And in this case, it's obviously the merchants, right? Mm. If the only way or if the discounted way to get their services or the products is to pay in Bitcoin, then people are going to pay you in Bitcoin, right? They're the hot girls. And that's what we're optimizing ZapRite for. Yeah, I like to think about it. I use the example a lot, not the dating app one but i'll pay the gas station in dollars so long as they're willing to take my dollars but if they open up the opportunity and then they create an incentive for me to pay in bitcoin i'm going to pay in bitcoin yeah. right um but that's why it's a a seller or merchant driven shift um the other thing though is as bitcoin increases in purchasing power this is just something for people that are new that's going to happen to you and you just kind of have to accept it is you're going to put like 1% of your money in Bitcoin and then Bitcoin's going to go up 10 times and 100 times and it's going to go from 10% to 90% of your, of your savings. And once you get into a position where Bitcoin represents pretty much all of your savings, like someone like myself or someone like Will or 
increasingly a lot of people that have held Bitcoin for a long time, you actually want those outlets. Like someone would say, well, it's not rational to spend their Bitcoin because it's you know, going up X percent a year. But if, it's, if you have 100% of your money or close to it in the better form of money that has appreciated over time, you actually want your liquidity to be more diverse than just somebody that allows you to convert it back into dollars. You're, you're actively looking for those businesses. And that's what a lot of our merchants have found is they actually say, you know, like, and we have, we use this example because it's kind of random, but it seems to be happening more and more frequently. We have dentists on the platform. Dentists say, I'm going to, I want to accept Bitcoin as money and I'm going to make this part of my strategy. And they put a bat signal out to the people in their area that they accept Bitcoin. There's Bitcoiners everywhere. And then they start getting new customers, mm. you know? So um, if you build it into the strategy, it makes yep. sense. But there is also this reality that there's a lot of people that are, you know, having the vast majority of all their savings in Bitcoin. And those people need to spend it every day to survive and to better their lives. Um, and so that is not as intuitive to somebody that only has 1% of their money in Bitcoin, but that's not them for a few more years. Yeah. Fascinating. I, I want to change uh, just one final question before we wrap things up. And it's, a, it's off topic from the payment stuff we were just talking about. Sure. It seems to me like uh, from a policy standpoint, things are really heating up from like a global comp competition standpoint. I'm curious if you guys see it the same and uh, just, I guess, any thoughts that you have on on that particular talking point? Yeah, I mean, I, I worry about this, you know, frequently, you know, being a United States citizen and, uh, uh, you know, wanting you know, I, I'm a, I, I consider myself a patriot. Uh, I like the United States. I would like the United States to take a pro Bitcoin stance because I think it's uh, vital for the future of Amen. our country. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we have a huge outsized outsized advantage uh, uh, compared to other countries, and that you know, we have a strong history of federalism in the Tenth Amendment, and that we have you know fifty sovereign states that are going to try to outcompete themselves on uh, being. Uh, a, a good jurisdiction for Bitcoin to operate in, uh, whether it's, you know, for businesses or for payments or, you know, whatever it is, um, that they're going to be competing over that. Um, but there are smaller countries out there that can be a little bit more nimble and have been, uh, to date, um, like El Salvador. However, uh, you know, that global competition that you, that you, you know, talk about, like, I ultimately think the United States is well poised for two reasons. One is we already have a lot of money, right? And we're talking mm -hmm. about money and we produce a lot. And so that to the extent that, you know, the citizens of the United States and therefore the government, you know, obtains Bitcoin, we, we, we have an outside, we, we have a head start, right? And two is, you know, every Bitcoin maximalist should be a 10th Amendment maximalist because um, the states themselves, I think recently in the last couple of years are getting more comfortable flexing their sovereign muscles and uh, proving that, um, they can make independent sovereign decisions and uh, whether it's Bitcoin or otherwise, and uh, they're doing it. And a lot of it is to the benefit of Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. And then what, what I'd add is I think, you know, one of the things that, that sailor said that I think is right. It, well, he pointed out that, that there's something controversial about Bitcoin as a medium exchange. And there's something that's not controversial about, you know, Madison Avenue real estate. Sure. It doesn't, if it's controversial that Bitcoin is money and that it's going to be used as, to facilitate payments, it's like, that is a reality. It's not that I don't think we're, we're not naive in that respect, but, but I also think that it's even more controversial that it's a store of value. You know, I think that, um, and that the, the, the heat that comes is the only way th through the fire. Uh, essentially, and that governments need money too, and they're going to figure that out. Um, many are already, and that with whether it's global competition on hash rate or it's you know the the world seems to be a little bit volatile beyond you know the price of any financial asset, just in terms of uh, what's happening, you know, in terms of uh, global conflict, right? But that 
it's actually Bitcoin or it's a good form of money that everyone can trade that creates and aligns economic incentives and that that economic incentive is maximal to the most amount of people. And so um, everyone has an incentive to mine Bitcoin across the world. And even though there's some governments that will be more restrictive to it in the short term, as Bitcoin rises and as Bitcoin presents a more competitive, I think this is the direction you were talking about, it's providing a more competitive pressure to the dollar, um, doesn't mean that any country in the world, regardless of who they are, is necessarily going to want to give up the uh, the power that they extract through their currency. And globally, that could be the dollar or the euro or the yen, but then also internal to the country, something like Russia, like they don't want to give control of the ruble to to Bitcoin. And, you know, it's, Bitcoin's like water moving downhill. It's going to find the most efficient path, but it's moving downhill. Mm -hmm. And um, ultimately, as people figure it out, whether it's a nation state, a corporation, an individual, state, local community, um, they're all going to figure out that it's in their best interest to participate rather than not. And then once they're participating, they're part of this global trading network and there's an incentive to cooperate rather than than, than being adversarial. It's not necessarily going to immediately result in uh, world peace, but it's going to be the thing that aligns economic incentives to steer the world back in that direction. And I think that that is at the most macro level, the very positive thing. And then it does the same thing for every micro individual and every economic decision to allow each individual, you know, separate from that kind of the the global backdrop and Bitcoin's position in its very competitive dynamic for for world money uh, gives everybody a tool individually to just get up in the morning, produce value for other human beings around them, and store that value for the benefit of their family and for the people in their direct vicinity. And I think that um, the more people that are building toward that future. The, the least amount of pain that's going to be felt between here and there. Guys, I could talk to you all day. Uh, <laughs> I really could. Um, really enjoyed this discussion. And uh, if you guys have anything you want to highlight, just throw it out here to the audience. I just got one question. Did you take yeah. your son up to uh, the top of the tram? Did you guys brave <laughs> that? Oh, Lordy. Do I have a, oh, there, there was a quite the story with this. Should I tell the story? I, I feel bad for my son that I would tell this story though. Well, let, let's, let's <laughs> take it, it off offline. Yeah, I, we'll I thought I, I had better judgment. I originally said, don't do it. And then other people that I, were, I was with said, no, you can do it. And I was trying to instill confidence. So I, I, I want to hear about it, but let's not uh, yeah, yeah, let's do that my, on air. We, uh, we got up there and it was, uh, it, it got interesting. Okay. <laughs> it's an insane place to be. Dude, it is an I, insane place. To I told be. you, it's I was intimidating. A, I was afraid to go up there. Okay, yeah. so, uh, I'll it, I'll I'll tell that story to your son sometime too. So he would uh, enjoy it. But yeah, the yeah. view. I mean, the view up top there. We're talking about Jackson Hole. Uh, yes, going to the top of. Uh, they got waffles. The world's best waffles on top of the mountain there. Uh, wow, what stunning, stunning view. Something that uh, just blow your mind but and then you yeah. go straight down from there and you go in, in such a steep mountain i mean yes. for anybody that's never been there uh it has to be one of the steepest mountains in the united states mm -hmm. uh all around just black diamonds everywhere you look yep. but yeah all right guys give uh the audience a handoff uh to the, the things you guys are working on yeah, come check us out at uh, zapright.com. You can get a 30-day free trial. Um, and you can find me on Twitter, uh, at Will Cole or Noster. I, I can't recite my MPUB, but you can find me there. Yeah, and it's Zaprite, Z-A-P-R-I-T-E. If you're a, a business or individual that's either um, issuing invoices, payment links on a website, a more complicated web store, uh, we're really focused on on those specific types of payments today rather than something like a point of sale, but we can help support point of sale. But if you're if you run a business, you're a Bitcoiner, you understand why Bitcoin stores value and you're thinking that, hey, it might make a lot of sense to accept Bitcoin, reach out to us. We'll we'll help deal with you directly and get you onboarded to uh, the vanguard of Bitcoin payments. And then for me, you can uh, find my book, uh, Gradually Then Suddenly, if you're Charles, still trying to figure out why Bitcoin is obsoleting all other money. Uh, you can find that at thesafehouse.com slash gradually. 
Um, and then safe is spelled S A I F the safe house.com slash gradually. So yeah, right. Preston, appreciate you having us on. Thanks Preston. Yeah. yeah. We'll have links to all that in the show notes and we'll catch you guys next week. What the federal reserve would have to do to stop Michael Saylor would be to raise interest rates to be greater than the expected value that, you know, we think Bitcoin's going to appreciate by. And so if we look at Bitcoin's, you know, the Kager, right, what are the returns for Bitcoin? Let's say conservatively like 30%, 50%, right? So they would have to raise interest rates to be greater than 30 to 50% in order to stop Michael Saylor. That would destroy the financial system, right? The entire fiat system would collapse if they raised interest rates to 30 to 50%.